next presentation it will be by Marco Krapels. Marco Krapels is an executive vice president with Rabobank. And when I talked to Marco before we came here, I said, you know, I've known about Rabobank for over 20 years because when I used to travel to the Netherlands to look at wind turbines and uh, uh, the wind turbines development, farmer owned wind turbines in the Netherlands in the 1980s and early 1990s were financed by Rabobank. Rabobank has been a leader in financing consumer owned, farmer owned, homeowner owned renewable energy in the Netherlands for over 20 years. Marco Krapels. Before I talk about the money behind renewable energy and why it makes business sense, why it's a great investment for me and why it's economically sensible for my clients, I actually went to meet one of my clients uh, who's a farmer and he went solar and I said, Eric, I'm going to interview you and I'm going to show you a little video about you uh, because it's much more interesting to listen to a client that's actually adopted renewable energy that may not vote like we vote, but he did it because it made perfect business sense. So here's Eric. Booker is a Syrah-based Rhone winery. We are very big into renewable energy. There is uh, solar panels on the top here, and eventually every vehicle that's powered here will be powered through this winery, through the solar. It's so crazy with, with energy costs, you know, spike, go up, go down with rolling blackouts. I didn't want that to be able to bring a company down that relies so heavily on keeping wine barrels cold keeping fermentations hot. When I saw solar, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I could either pay an electric company or I can uh, pay for solar. The cost is about the same, the payback is very short, and then I'm my own power company. H how would I not do that? As a business owner, if you're not looking at what potential uh, uh, energy costs are going to be, then I think you're doing your, your workers, your employees, and yourself a serious disservice. Things like storage of energy and sell back of energy, though, that's all coming, that's all on the horizon. Not only uh, should everyone look at this, everyone should actually just step up and be doing this. It's that simple. That's, um, I thought it was awesome too. You know, it's, um, these are real people, you know, working the land and he's taking control of his own power um, because it's, uh, it's, and I think that's what we're doing too. We're saying, okay, you know, we, we know that we need to transition to 100% renewable energy. It's uh, a moral and environmental imperative. Uh, we know, Professor Jacobson, you're gonna hear from him later, that it's scientifically possible, the technology's are ready, we can transition. But, you know, I'm here to talk to you about money. You know, I'm the evil banker in the room. And uh, it's an honor to be in, in your presence, but it, it has to make business sense, right? So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the economics behind financing renewable energy for us and why it makes business sense for us and how it actually also has benefited our clients. So um, picture on the front is, um, is one of my clients. Uh, his name is uh, Mike Montero. He owns a dairy farm and he also owns a one megawatt uh, solar farm. Um, I'm gonna, 600 billion is the amount that we as taxpayers have poured into subsidizing the fossil fuel industry over the last 60 years. And one would expect that after such a great investment, we must have an infinite source of clean power, we must have declining prices, and we must have a stable source of power. Not. My clients, me, before I went solar, we've seen our electricity cost increase from about two to three cents to about 13 cents, and this is in California. Um, and across the United States, we've seen prices uh, increase substantially over a time period when we invested $600 billion. Terrible investment for the US taxpayer. So then five, six years ago, we came up with the idea to put in some subsidies for the evil renewable energy industry. And, um, and we've subsidized a little bit of that, a small fraction of the 600 billion that we've been putting into, um, into fossil fuels. And what have we gotten? We have seen a substantial drop in cost per kilowatt hour generation of both wind and solar. 
And we know where this is headed. I mean, we are headed for an acceleration of the inevitable transition to clean energy because it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be cheaper. And um, we need to just keep our politicians in check to make sure that when it comes time to permanently extend the PTC, when it comes ta time to phase out the, um, uh, the ITC, but not immediately, but over a longer term period, that we have the right politicians in there that understand that we need a few more years. We can't just suddenly and abruptly stop supporting an industry that we've only supported for five years, while another industry has received our $600 billion over the last 60 years. So who is adopting, from a business perspective, uh, renewable energy? Um, and so it's, it's large, large corporations. I mean, you see Walmart on top, um, and I've invested in funds uh, with companies like SolarCity that, um, that are uh, selling power to Walmart on the long-term fixed price contracts. And why is Walmart doing it? Sure, they have sustainably minded executives in the company, but they're doing it because they're locking in a long-term source of power at a fixed cost, which is not available. I mean, my clients, Walmart and others, were basically waiting for each year's utility bill and hoping that the cost would, be, would at least stay the same, which we've seen on the previous graph, is just not the case. You know, so um, what, what renewable energy and solar and wind are providing our clients, large corporations as well as uh, smaller farmers, like Eric Jensen, like Lakeside Dairy, is they are providing our clients an opportunity to turn a volatile cost of goods sold, because that's how I analyze it, a volatile input cost into a fixed cost. It's like a derivative, you know? So I manage a derivative team and I manage a renewable energy finance team. And actually the two have a lot in common. When you sell someone an interest rate swap, you're selling them a hedge against a future volatile rate. When someone goes solar, they're effectively hedging a future volatile energy cost. You're saying, okay, can I get a hedge? Can somebody sell me an energy hedge? don't need it. You just make your own power, and by making your own power, you're effectively locking in the cost of energy for 30 years. And the math is really simple. I even understand it. Your math is this. The cost of the solar minus local incentives and tax deductions is the numerator, and you divide that over the expected amount of kilowatt hours that the solar system will produce each year over a 30 year lifespan, because the useful life is very long, and if the outcome of that simple math equation is a number that is lower than what you're currently paying the utility, you go solar. It's a no brainer. And so my clients are seeing that, and these guys, you know, they're farmers, they wear overalls and they drive tractors and they have trucks and they own guns. <laughs> and they're going solar. And so this is, um, this is not a partisan issue. This is not a tree hugger issue. This just makes business sense. And um, I wanted to just share those thoughts with you. Uh, we have, um, you know, so the way I look at solar, it's giving businesses real power independence. Real power independence. Not, oh, let's frack the hell out of Pennsylvania and let's take the gas and let's take it to a power plant and, and let's turn that into electricity, which at the end of the day will not turn into a lower utility rate for the rate payer. We've had cheap coal for 20 years. That didn't turn my bill into a lower bill. Didn't turn my dairy client's bill into a lower power bill. So at the end of the day, the way we fix that volatile cost of power is just by owning it. You just own your own power, make your own power at a fixed cost. And so I see this as a, as a trend. Uh, it's continuing. And um, it's very encouraging to see that, particularly in my client demographic. Now, for the bank, it's been a great investment. Uh, since we fi started financing solar in the US um, over the last five years, uh, and we have billions of dollars out right now, our default rate is zero, zero. No defaults. Billions of dollars, no default. And the returns are high. Why are the returns high? Well, the asset class still, by and large, is not well understood. 
Most people, when you say solar, they think, oh, Solyndra, and they run for the hills. Solar is you're financing a power plant. It has an infinite source of fuel. Sun is going to shine, particularly in this state. And you're selling power onto, under long-term fixed-rate contracts. How can you lose money doing that? You just want to make sure that the inverters and the panels are from, either, from this proven technology. The manufacturer doesn't even have to be around in five years. They may not be around. But this technology has been around for 30 years. So you're financing proven technology, infinite source of power, long-term fixed contract. No brainer. Now, there are about 14 banks in the entire United States. With 12, there are 12,000 banks. 14 banks, I believe, actually have a renewable energy finance department. So that means there's not a lot of competition for that capital. And at some point, I'm going to be full on exposure as much as I love this, I cannot lend billions of dollars to a single client. So at some point, we're going to need other sources of capital. And that's where I think we have a tremendous opportunity. We'll talk about it later in the panel. Um, but there are platforms emerging like Solar Mosaic. Uh, Greg Rosen is here. Uh, if you'd like to invest, sign up with solarmosaic.com. For a little $25, you can make money like me, like a banker. Uh, the only difference is you're engaging the public at large and you're democratizing the funding going into an asset class that we know to be uh, a very safe and, and sound investment. Those are some of my thoughts. Some of the other thoughts I'm sure we'll talk about during the panel. And I know Paul's going to hit me up on feeding tariffs. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Marco. That was a, a fantastic presentation. And just to add that Schleswig-Holstein Landesbank, so that's a, a bank like, like Rabobank, but only lands in Schleswig-Holstein in northern Germany, a, a state, a land in uh, northern Germany. In 20 years, they've had zero defaults in renewable energy investments, yet they did lose quite a bit in real estate. 